Well, welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. This time round, we're looking at uh, something uh, slightly peculiar from the 1960s. They made 25,000 of them, but they're still a bit of a curio these days, and that's the Jaguar S-Type. It was sort of spawned from the Mark II Jaguar, which was a wonderful car that's ticked more boxes than it ought to have done, really. It was a, a comfortable saloon car. It was nimble. It was stylish. It was reasonably economical and it was fast. But Jaguar, uh, Sir William Lyons was uh, always striving to provide something better. And with the uh, launch of the E-Type in 1961, he decided to take some of the underpinnings from the E-Type and put them under this sort of fairly staid, uh, but also avant-garde saloon. Again, ticking lots of boxes at the same time. And he came up with the S-Type Jaguar. And it was a very interesting car. As I say, they made 25,000 of them, so quite a lot. And it was almost carved out a unique niche for itself in the market. The Jaguar XK 120, 140 and 150 were very much sports cars. The XK 120 was a revelation when it came out in 1948. But this is uh, 1966 and uh, it's a really interesting car from a technical point of view. It's got the beautiful XK engine, which we'll be having a look at a bit more. And it's got the E-type rear suspension, albeit slightly wider. It's four inches wider, actually, the rear suspension on the S-type than the E-type. This car, uh, Craig did some work on the front seats in the uh, previous workshop catch-up video and has brought those back to life without overcooking it so that you're actually not sitting on them instead of in them. It's still very much comfortable and very supportive, but also not, as I say, you're not sliding about all over the place as well. So it's quite, a, believe it or not, that's quite a difficult compromise to strike, actually. I've had some cars in here, uh, even some Lamborghini Muras that have been retrimmed by very famous people. And sometimes you're sitting on them and your head's like that in the roof because they haven't got the padding right. It's ever so important. Um, but anyway, this is a really lovely example. Uh, we're doing some work on the rear suspension, the rear brakes, uh, and um, as well as Craig's work. So let's have a look at some of its more interesting facets. Well, undoubtedly, one of the major contributors to Jaguar's uh, success, phenomenal success through the, uh, the, the 42 years um, between 1948 and uh, 1990, 44 years, was this, the XK engine, an absolute marvel of engineering. And they churned these out in their thousands, tens of thousands Jaguar. And it's so funny because um, it is an engineering marvel, but if they hadn't made so many of them, it would be considered an, an absolutely wonderful thing and um, a real thing of amazing excellence and beauty. But because they turned them out uh, in so many models and in such huge quantities, it's sort of taken for granted. But this is an absolutely wonderful engine. It was developed by uh, Sir William Lyons during the war with Walter Haynes, Hassan. It's some very talented engineers. They'd never engaged in the aero engine thing around those years because Rolls-Royce had got the whole thing wrapped up with the, uh, the Merlin, which started badly but went on to be uh, hugely successful during the war years and afterwards. But um, they concentrated on car engine design and came up with this. Around about 1943, they started designing and experimenting with it. It was limited, quite typical of British engines at the time. They were limited for tax reasons. You paid tax on the size of the bore in the cylinders, not the size of the engine. So you ended up with uh, what's called an undersquare engine. So the stroke was very long that the, cylinder, the piston traveled up and down inside the cylinder but the bore was quite small. Um, so if you imagine a, a P were going up and down a tube, that's a bit of an extreme exaggeration, but um, as opposed to the Italian engines of the era and the, uh, the German en engines to a certain extent, where the, the, they weren't taxed on the, uh, the bore size, they were taxed on the actual size of the cylinders or the power output. Um, and that meant that they could be uh, more over square, so shorter stroke and larger bore. And one of the contributing factors to this was the uh, the cylinder head is made of aluminium alloy it's actually rolls-royce again um, because of the schneider trophy the, the the racing planes of the 1920s and early 30s rolls-royce had to come up with some very high performance engines to win that and they gained a lot of experience about bearing materials different alloys they came up with what's called the the triple metal 
um, engine shell bearing, which is copper indium, uh, copper lead with a layer of indium over the top, which are still used in high performance engines to this day. And the cylinder head on this is made out of one of Rolls-Royce's alloys called RR50, which was originally used as a piston material. Uh, the British pioneered aluminium pistons and engines, which are now pretty well universal all that time ago in sort of uh, racing engines and military engines and they specified that alloy for the cylinder head it worked ever so well uh, this engine was almost indestructible in spite of its long stroke which means everything was having to do more work instead of a shorter stroke piston velocities were higher etc but it didn't matter this engine was an absolute gem and it's still being tuned and stretched to this day up to 4.7 litres and big power outputs now, well over 300 brake horsepower, considering that this engine was first launched to the public in 1948. I can't imagine there are many engines in the world that were literally almost unchanged for 44 years and still powered racing cars and road cars. Um, it was as smooth and refined as it was powerful and tractable. Uh, a remarkable achievement. So uh, let's have a look at the other ACE in the S-Types pack. Well, this is one of the, uh, this is the main uh, secret weapon of the, uh, the Jaguar S-Type. Um, it was, uh, it's this, what's called IRS or independent rear suspension. And uh, the normal Jaguar Mark II uh, had what's called a live rear axle, which was literally essentially a tube with the hubs for the back wheels on either end and the differential in the middle. And the problem with that is that the tube is located by cart springs, leaf springs, which run from front to back either side, and a couple of other bits. Um, but the thing is just a great big, a quite heavy assembly, which is floating round underneath the car. And it's, it's perfectly utilitarian. In fact, um, Ferrari used it right up until 1965 on their cars, but Jaguar were way, way ahead of them and most other car manufacturers because for the S-Type, they ditched the Mark II live rear axle and came up with this, the IRS, the independent rear suspension. And the beauty of this is several fold. First of all, it reduces what's called the unsprung weight quite drastically. Uh, and that means to say, instead of having this huge, heavy assembly bouncing round, um, which actually causes, no matter how good the suspension is, it causes the car to bounce around as well. It transmits uh, the road, the weightiness, the inertia of the bumps up into the car. The beauty of this is that most of it is connected to the car and not to the wheels. So you have very low unsprung weight, which means that uh, the bit that's actually doing the work with the wheels out here is very small and very light. And that actually affects the ride hugely. It makes it far smoother because there's less weight flapping about um, <clears throat> that the su suspension has to cope with. So, um, and the other thing is that on a live rear axle, the, the angle of the back wheels is determined because it's all um, one assembly. It's determined by the end of the axle. And the wheels always remain perfectly upright, uh, which is fine, except when you come to a corner what happens is the outside wheel, where all the weight is on, tends to tuck under and the tyre can tuck under and lose grip. Um, and that was one of the things with the Mark II. It was either a bit like a Porsche 911. It's either a great thing or a bad thing, depending on your point of view. The fact that the handling is so, um, uh, so imprecise. But with this, because you've got the upper drive shaft as the upper suspension link, and this one here is the lower one, uh, it's what's called um, an a unequal length wishbone type setup. It's not exactly like that in practicality, but it means that the two suspension arms move like that as the wheel pivots up and down, and it actually causes the tyre contact area to move as well the right way in relation to the road, which means you get more grip. So when the car, if the car was rolling over that way quite considerably, the wheel would pivot up and you would still have a good contact patch on the ground very clever uh, i'm making it very simplistic but there are disadvantages to this system as well and one of them is servicing you can see here this car has got a a leak from the differential pinion seal here and it actually makes servicing of the unit quite complex it's all in a cradle it comes down as an assembly um, and you've got the back brakes here as well if anything goes wrong with those 
It's not like being outside on the hub, the brake caliper. You can just take it off and service it. It's, it's considerably more involved. And the handbrake mechanism is right up top where you can't get at it. And it is prone to actually sticking the self-adjusting mechanism as well. So there are lots of disadvantages, but in terms, it's almost like it's a nightmare to maintain, but a dream to drive, if I can put it that way. But uh, this was used for years by Jaguar, extremely successfully. Um, it was first brought out in 1961 on the E-Type. That was one of the reasons why the E-Type was such a game changer, because it had this fabulous independent rear suspension when uh, Ferrari and most other manufacturers were still using um, uh, a big lolloping live rear axle. Um, now we actually, this car was too soft. I think the ride on it was too soft. Fortunately, we got these adjustable shock absorbers. So I have been adjusting them. It was there and I've moved it two stops clockwise, which should just control the body movement of the car, the damping, stop it bouncing around, but without making the ride too hard. And in fact, this whole IRS was one of the reasons, in fact, probably 90% of the reason why Jaguar had the best ride and handling compromise of any saloon car, possibly any car in the world during the 60s, 70s and 80s, I would say. Rolls-Royce, Mercedes, nobody could compete with the ride and handling compromise on the Jaguars. So real game changer, so beloved of hot rodders and customizers because they could take an, a, a rusty old um, Jaguar uh, take the IRS system off it and put it on their car and instantly have the most fabulous back suspension, plug and play. Um, so we're going to take this car out on the road now and I'll just see how this suspension uh, performs. We have got work to do, but um, nothing that can't be sorted with uh, simple nuts and bolts. Let's give it a run on the road then. Well, here we are in the, uh, the very luxurious Jaguar S-Type. Uh, and this car is, it's a real mixed bag, this car. It's a very uh, mixed character. It's a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, you had the Mark II, which was the, uh, the sporting car. Um, and yet this was sort of considered the more luxurious car, but it actually has the much more high-tech, high-performance rear suspension. So it was a very strange mix. Um, but Jaguar, Sir William Lyons, um, the founder and owner of Jaguar, actually in the 1960s, was um, uh, a, a real innovator and he had all sorts of um, different things at his disposal. Technologies, I mean the wonderful E-Type that was announced in 1961. Um, and that's part of the reason why this car has the character it has, is because so many parts of the E-Type are actually incorporated into it. The, uh, the engine is, is very similar, slightly less powerful, uh, with only two carburettors instead of three, but otherwise near identical. And yet it's, this car is a, a luxury saloon car, very refined, very capable. And in the 1960s, uh, the line between bank robber and uh, police pursuit car was extremely thin. Uh, you had either this, uh, or the Mark II Jaguar as the uh, the villain's or police's car of choice. In fact, the old film Robbery, uh, starring Stanley Baker, uh, about the great train robbery from the 1960s, um, actually features a Jaguar Mark II as the getaway car and the Jaguar S-Type, almost a, a carbon copy of this, as the police chase car. Um, so uh, very, very, never have cops and robbers um, probably shared this, a similar a form of transport. Yeah, it's uh, it, consequently, it's a real wolf in sheep's clothing, as the Jaguar Mark II is. The Jaguar Mark II is the sort of, um, uh, the, the, the blazer and uh, chinos, and this is the Savile Row suit, if you will. Um, but it's, uh, it's just such a lovely, refined car. And this is not the smoothest of roads, but the suspension is, absolutely silky smooth the body control is um, every bit as legendary as uh, Jaguar would have had us believe really and the, and the sort of press of the 1960s it's just lovely and smooth and it was no wonder that the the XJ6 that came out in 1968 I think or 1969 um, 
was such a, an, a, a world beater, really, because they were using this as the template. And the suspension is just fantastic. It just does it so well. Um, I'm just going to take this corner a little bit briskly. And just beautiful. The car doesn't lurch or roll fantastically well. Um, it just absolutely sits on the road beautifully. Power out of the corner, very little drama, just lovely. And that XK, that 3.8 litre uh, XK engine just pulling magnificently. It's, um, yeah, we've just adjusted um, as, uh, as uh, I did earlier those shock absorbers a couple of notches. And um, I think it's actually far better the body control. The owner's about to go on a thousand mile tour with uh, a car full of people and luggage. So I actually think he will find this far better in terms of uh, ride handling compromise. The last thing you want is to take away Jaguar's USP and make the ride harsh. That is not desirable at all um, and completely defeats the object really. Uh, very nice. The other thing about this car is it does have the overdrive on it, which was a wonderful phenomenon of the 50s and 60s really. By the early 70s, um, at least on most cars, uh, they'd gone over to five-speed gearboxes. The overdrive is a, an assembly that bolts onto the back of the gearbox and it uses a sun gear assembly to give you more, an, another gear if you like, uh, it's effectively a fifth gear. Um, which is great for cruising. It is a, a generic assembly. It was largely made by a company called Laycock de Normanville, um, and lots of manufacturers used it. Austin Healey's used it. Uh, Ferrari used it on their 330 GTs um, and 250 GTEs. Uh, it was uh, just a great bit of kit, but it was heavy and it was expensive. And it's controlled by a switch on the steering column here. It's electric. Um, it uses a solenoid to pull a plunger which engages the overdrive. Tremendously clever, um, but great fun to use because there's no changing gear. We're in fourth now. You just flick the switch and the revs drop. And there you go. You're in fifth gear, effectively. So much, so much more elegant than changing a, ge than, uh, changing a gear lever. If I take it up now, if I take the overdrive off, there's the revs going up. Normal fourth gear, very clever, but as I say, its manufacturers realized that it was so much easier just to build an extra gear at the back of the gearbox into the tail of the gearbox. So overdrive's uh, days were short-lived, but very agreeable. Yeah, this, this car is, uh, is uh, a very good place to be. Um, even by modern standards, the ride and body control is, is amazing. This car was just way ahead of its time in terms of suspension. Um, and as I say, Jaguar sort of ruled the world in terms of uh, ride and handling in the, uh, in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, Mercedes were woefully behind with the, uh, the W116 and even then the W126. Um, they somehow managed to have a firm ride and pretty uh, interesting handling by comparison. I'm sure plenty of people would disagree, but that's just, uh, that's just my opinion. Um, even road and track in the US, for all their sort of reliability concerns about Jags in the 70s, um, they, they said that the suspension was, was wonderful. Um, so yeah, this is uh, a very pleasant place to be. I will just try it through this corner again in a little spirited fashion, um, not quite the bank robber or pursuit, uh, police pursuit mode, but we'll just give it a little bit of opening up and uh, yeah, see, see part of that Jaguar magic. Just so undramatic, it just does it so beautifully. Real pull from that 3.8 litre engine, um, yeah. What a wonderful place to be this is, actually. Just a very good place to cover the miles. And that, that uh, really 
torquey. One of the benefits of an over square, an under square engine, uh, is that the the long stroke actually means the pistons are effectively pushing down on the the turning the engine, pushing down on the crankshaft for a longer time, which means you get more low down torque. And this car is just. Um, this engine works very well because of that. Okay, it's limited at 5,500 RPM. It's really over by 5,000, but it's got lots of low down pulling power. And um, if I drop it down to second, there it is, it's off. Very lovely throttle response. Uh, this is not a slow car, uh, 125, 125 miles an hour-ish top speed, which in 1966, as this car was, was moving. Um, and in fact, the S-Type, even though it's something of a, a sort of forgotten Jaguar in a way, actually outsold the Mark II uh, for a couple of years. Um, and uh, yeah, I can see why. The other thing is that these did come with power steering, which was an option on the Mark II. It does, it does make the world a difference, because otherwise they are very low geared and very heavy, the steering. This is, in spite of this absolutely enormous steering wheel, it is truly huge. Um, it's pretty, pretty sporty in a strange sort of way. It's quite direct. Um, yeah, very good, very good. I can point it with good accuracy. Uh, yeah not too shabby not too shabby well that concludes another Tyrrell's classic workshop and we'll be back with something else very soon